Hi folks, today we're going to continue on with our study in Matthew chapter 5. Let's quickly review the previous verses in that chapter that we've covered. In verses 1 through 6, Jesus tells us how we should approach our relationship with the Lord. He tells us to approach Him with humbleness, to seek His comfort, and to submit to Him. And finally, to seek His righteousness. And in verses 7 through 9, Jesus shifts in His words from the way that we should approach our relationship with God to the way we should live our lives. And He points out that we should be merciful, that we should show others the same mercy that God has shown us. And to be pure in heart, to keep it free from sin and fully devoted to the Lord to make sure that he sits on the throne of our lives and to be a peacemaker, to rest in his peace and to share his peace with others. In verses 10 through 12, Jesus shifts his focus on how others treat us. And it says that we are blessed when we are persecuted because of righteousness and that we are blessed when we are treated unfairly and finally it says the best is yet to come we have a heavenly home that awaits us and we will spend eternity with our heavenly father and Jesus where there will be no more hurt pain or death that doesn't sound wonderful well today uh, that's going to bring us to verse 13. In this verse, Jesus uh, points out one thing that we're very familiar with in order to teach us about the lives that we are to live. Can you imagine what a life, what our lives would be without salt? <laughs> have you ever tried to go on a salt-free diet and not have salt in your food? It doesn't taste very well, does it? Well, today's message is entitled, Being the Salt. And so once again, let's take a seat with the disciples on, on that hillside and listen to the words of Jesus. Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if a the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. As Jesus said this, the people gathered around him that day would reflect on what they knew about salt. To them, salt was a necessity and very valuable. In ancient times, Roman soldiers were sometimes even paid in salt. Salt was a, used as a unit of exchange, a seasoning, a preservative, a, a disinfectant even, and as an offering and a sacrifice. While we may not put a high price on salt in our society today to the people listening to jesus that day salt was very valuable jesus was telling them you are the salt of the earth you are of great worth and value and that's the first point folks you are of great worth Look what Psalm 129 says. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, O oh Lord, know it completely you hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me such knowledge is too wonderful for me too lofty 
for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light becomes night before uh, around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day and for the darkness is as the light to you. Listen to what it says next. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, listen, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. <laughs> Do you ever think about yourself that way? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are important. Your works are wonderful, it says. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. And that's the mother's womb. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book. Before one of them came to me. Now folks, you may not think about that, but God knows you. He knew you before you were even you. You are that important to Him. Never forget how valuable you are. You are of great worth and value to the Lord. How, value, how valuable are you? Well, look at John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So to God, you are valued so much that he was willing to send his one and only son to be a sacrifice for you and your sins. To Jesus, you are valuable enough to be worth the pain, the ridicule, the suffering, the torture, and even death that he endured both in life and on the cross because of his great love for you. Jesus gave us all for you. You are of great worth. And don't ever forget that, folks. You are of great worth. Salt is also used in sacrifice and offering. Look at what it says in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. Season all your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. Add salt to all your offerings. And so the second point today is you are to be since you are salt, you are to be an offering and a sacrifice to him. You are called to service and sacrifice. You are called to not only do what is required, but to go above and beyond on your own free will. 
In the Old Testament, we also find references like this as well. The Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 5. Don't you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever, forever by a covenant of salt? Salt represents not only offering and sacrifice, but a promise, a covenant, a binding agreement. As he has promised us, we should be promised to him as well. We are to freely offer and sacrifice ourselves to him. What does a sacrifice look like? Well, let's look in Romans chapter 12. Turn it there if you would. Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Then it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good and pleasing and perfect will for by the grace given me I say to every one of you do not think of yourself more highly than you ought but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in according in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each one of you for just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function and so in Christ we though many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts, it says, according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, what then serve? If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. And I'll tell you folks, we need a whole lot more encouragers in our lives today. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously, it says. And if it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully and then it says love must be sincere hate what is evil cling to what is good be devoted to one another in love honor one another above yourselves never be lacking in zeal but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord be joyful in hope Patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low positions. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave God's leave room for 
God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will replace, as the Lord on the cross. Contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will be heaping the coals on his heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You see, we willingly sacrifice our own personal desires to follow His ways and His will. We don't do it begrudgingly or with regret. We do it out of love. Let's go back and visit a familiar conversation that Jesus had with one of the teachers of the law. In Matthew, oh, excuse me, in Mark chapter 12, begin verse 28. One of the teachers of the law, and you know this passage, we talk about it all the time, but it's important, folks. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. <laughs> Jesus always gives a good answer, doesn't he? But, he's, but he asked him, of all the commandments, which is most important. <laughs> yeah. He wanted a Cliff Notes version of Jesus' ministry. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength and the second is this love your neighbor as yourself there is no commandment greater than these Jesus said well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no one but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You see, we should be motivated by our love for him in all that we do. Everything in our lives should be driven by that love we have for the Lord. Our offering and our sacrifice should always start with this love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength in doing this we also offer our bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God as our true and proper worship. When you wake up in the morning, think about that. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The other thing we need to remember about salt is that it is only useful if it is pure. Look at what Jesus says. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled 
underfoot. So, stay righteous and pure. Salt, sodium chloride, by itself, in its purest form, is very stable and will not lose its effectiveness or potency. All those wonderful things we said about salt earlier pertain to salt that is pure. You see, the problem arises when there are impurities in that salt. The best and purest salt came from salt water back then in ancient times. Most of the salt, however, came from salt marshes. And when salt was har harvested from the salt marshes, there was often other impurities present as well. And as a result, the actual salt being more soluble than the impurities that were there would leach out. The residue that would be left behind would be so diluted that it would be of little worth. Those listening to Jesus that day knew this. They were very familiar with salt. And they knew this. They knew that if there were impurities in the salt, the salt would not be useful anymore. It would leach out. What was of great worth and value became worthless and ineffective when it became impure and corrupted. As believers, we leave our old life of sin behind us. All those impurities and things, we leave that behind us. Look what Romans chapter 6 says, begin with verse 1. What shall I say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may be may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So those are the impurities, folks. The sin or this the impurities. Or don't you know that all of us were called to be baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death like this, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. For we know that our old self has been crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because everyone who has died has been set free from sin now if we died in Christ we believe that he we will also live with him we know that since Christ was raised from the dead he cannot die again death no longer has mastery over him the death he died he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Listen to what it says. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. And those are the impurities again, folks. We're called to live a life of righteousness and not 
of evil like we once had. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God. And there's that sacrifice again, right? That's that sacrifice and that offering, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself. Here we go again. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Grace. When we are saved, the blood of Jesus takes care of the impurities that were associated with our old life of sin. We are purified and sanctified. The gift is foretold in Isaiah chapter 1, verses, verse 18. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow pure though they are red as crimson they will be like wool at that moment we become purified salt folks we are called to be righteous Jesus reminds us of this in his words in verse 6 of this chapter, Matthew 5. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. This righteousness and purity begins at the core of who we are, our heart. Loving the Lord first and foremost keeps us focused and on course. For the new life for which we have been called. That purity begins in our hearts. Jesus tells us in verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. See, the world will try to corrupt us and dilute our purity. It will try to persecute us as we talked about last time the world and satan will also try to entice us to rejoin our old and sinful way of life trying to pull us back into it the pull of the world is strong but once we give into it we are contaminated and diluted no longer pure and that's what jesus is telling us that we need to be pure like pure salt. We are called upon to resist the ways of the world and the life of sin that we once lived. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, Love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. Remember what I told you about salt being stable? Sadly, in multiple pulpits across our country, there is a tendency to water down the gospel so that the world will accept it. Unfortunately, this diluted word is not God's word. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, 
listen, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about such things. God's word points us to the purity that we live in Christ. Philippians chapter 1 verses 9 through 11 says, and This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you will be able to discern what is best and may be what, pure and blameless for the day of Christ. <laughs> pure and blameless, folks. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of of God that you may be pure and blameless you see Jesus calls us to be the salt of the earth he says you are the salt of the earth but if the salt loses its saltiness how can it be made salty again it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown down and trampled Underfoot. Jesus reminds us that we, that each and every one of you is of great worth, valuable enough for him to experience the pain, the ridicule, and the suffering, the torture, and the death he endured on the cross and in life because of his great love for each and every one of you. And folks, we are called as salt to be an offering and a sacrifice to him that we willingly sacrifice our own desires to follow His ways and His will. We are called to stay righteous and pure, to resist the temptations and influences of this world. Folks, living this life sometimes can be difficult and there can be challenges but if God is for us, <laughs> who can be against us? I hope that each and every one of you will strive to be the salt of the earth. I love you all. I miss you all. May God bless each and every one of you. Until I see you next time, I love you.